Today we have a very exciting debate organized and planned on the issue of Cape independence. And we're going to be answering and asking some very important questions. Questions like, is the ANC a criminal organization? Or is it just an organization full of criminals? The ANC has just destroyed everything in this country. 28 years you continue to, you know, to allow this to happen. We should blame ourselves. Our people, they lack the education. They don't understand the power that they have of voting out the ANC. If the government does to you what apartheid has done to you, vote them out. Let's support Mandela. DA, you're on your way out. You're not going to survive. If the Western Cape were to secede, can we keep all the wine for ourselves? Why is it called a civil war and not an uncivil war? But more seriously, can the Western Cape secede? Should it do it? Do we still consider ourselves South Africans? Haven't we mentally and emotionally seceded already? Exiting Cape is an emotional decision. We have every right to secede. And you know what? We're going to. Hello, my name is Donald, and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our world view. Joining me is a star and excellent panel. First year on my left is Phil Craig, the spokesperson and co-founder of the Cape Independence Advocacy Group. A little known fact is also that Phil is the agent for Her Majesty's Secret Service, MI6. Here we have Ibrahim Rasul. I mean, I'm just gonna name a few of his titles. He has so many. He has been the premier of the Western Cape. He has been the South African ambassador to the United States. He has been an MP for the ANC. And if you watch the online interview that Salim Wing did with Ibrahim, you'd also realize Ibrahim has a very loud parrot at the beginning of that conversation. Then we have, of course, Faiki Mentura. Faiki is former ANC MP. She is now a member of the Action SA Senate. And of course, we all know her for her courage in exposing the Zuma Gupta corruption, one of the first individuals to do that. Then we have Dr. Corne Mulder. Corne is the chief whip of the Freedom Front Plus in Parliament. He is the leader of the Freedom Front Plus in the Western Cape. And he is currently South Africa's <coughs> longest serving parliamentarian. Now, how many years is that now? 34. 34 years, and how incredible is that? And then, of course, she almost didn't make it to this plate, but we're very grateful she did, Benedicta van Minnen. She is a former councillor for the DA in Cape Town, and she is an MP currently for the DA representing the Western Cape. Corne <laughs> Mulder, you have the microphone. Five minutes, every person gets a lot of time of five minutes. Why should the Western Cape secede? Donald, thank you very much for the invitation to participate tonight. If it was two years ago, this debate would not have taken place for the simple reason that it was irrelevant. It was a topic that nobody discussed really, but things have changed. In the last two years, I can assure you that we've seen many articles being written in newspapers, in periodicals. We've had different discussions, different debates, Cape Town Press Club, in all the national newspapers, etc. Suddenly, it's a very hot topic to be discussed, and that's why we are here, and it's a privilege to participate with the colleagues around the table. You ask me the question why the Western Cape should secede. I think it's maybe a wrong question, and I'll try to explain it in this way. To me, to secede means secession, and that basically is a, a method. It's a method to obtain a certain objective. I look at a different objective. My objective is that I believe that the Cape should be independent, and that we should have an independence at state in that instance, and there are different methods to get to that specific point. Secession or secede is one of those, but there are other methods as well. Now, I would say there are two basic and very relevant questions if you go into this debate. And the first one would be, why should the Western Cape tolerate the corruption, incompetence and implosion under the current ANC government what, that we are seeing in South Africa and that we are experiencing on a daily basis? And the second question would be, is there any benefit for the people of the Western Cape to stay part of a failed state South Africa governed by the ANC at this stage. Now, if you look at the constitutional debate, it's always been between two basic huge alternatives. The one would be to look into what we currently have, a centralized unitary state, 
And the other one would be more federal state with federal options, subsidiarity, devolution of power that can also lead to the independence in the end. Now, interesting enough, if you remember the constitution writing process way back in 1996, at the beginning of that process, there was an ad placed in the media by the process. And the ad said the following, South Africa at that stage, 20 million women, 18 million men, eight religions, 25 church groups, 31 cultural groups, 14 languages, nine racial groups, one country. And that was the challenge right from the beginning. If you want to create one state with one constitutional dispensation, how do you accommodate? So we've heard quite often that we've got supposed to be have unity and diversity, etc., etc. But we've experienced the rest completely different in the last three dec decades. You remember at some stage, we all heard about the Rainbow Nation. I don't know when anybody have heard about that term in the recent years. And that's been replaced largely by a completely defunctional state, dysfunctional state, where we have this unemployment rate that is completely out of control, we've got corruption, we've got everything that is going wrong. Because of that, there's been this reality that the Western Cape sees itself differently from the rest of South Africa. And if you go back in our history, we've got an artificial colonial boundary drawn in 1910 by a colonial power calling all of us South Africans. And I've seen how the ANC tried in the last 28 years to create this nation of South Africa. And we've been stumbling from one sporting event to the next. Huge enthusiasm at each and every event, and it lasts about for three months. But the reality is very different. It's not a question why the Western Cape should or should not. It's a reality that is playing itself out. It's going to happen. It's only a question of when and how. That's just the reality. As we are experiencing the ANC's collapse and implosion at the moment, and we see that the failed state is becoming more and more stronger and is happening on a daily basis, this reality will get stronger and stronger throughout. People may not be aware of that. There's an organization which two years ago had 7,000 signed up members. It's called Cape Exit. That number of members, not Facebook group, not the petition, signed up members grew from 7,000 to 825,000. And the people who signed and became members of Cape Exit in completing that membership form clearly indicates that they are, first of all, in favor of independence for the Western Cape. And secondly, that if there's a referendum, and there will be more than one, perhaps, a referendum, they will vote in favor of such a referendum. That's so it's a reality. Time, it's wonderful. I can hear that. And it should get louder. <laughs> the reality is that this idea of self for the Western Cape to become independent is going to grow and it doesn't have to be in conflict with the rest of South Africa. We are moving into a new dispensation and the only thing that is sure in politics is that everything changes. The government creates the illusion that they care about the people and that they govern in the best interest of the people. And the people, they create the illusion that we don't see what's wrong in South Africa. Thank you very much, I'm Donald, and good evening to my fellow panelists and the audience that's here. Tonight it's not ambassador, former premier, whatever, it's just Kapenaar. I'm a Capetonian and South African, and the two are not in contradiction. I want to say that the reality of diversity that Cornet was speaking about was, as another side of the coin, a reality that drove people like myself and Feiki to fight under the vision of for a united, non-racial, democratic, non-sexist, and free South Africa. And the un united was particularly important because what we faced in the run-up to 1994 was a South Africa that had 10 homelands, four provinces, that had four racialized administrations for everything, health, welfare, education, all of those kind of things. And the reality we were facing was a reality of fragmentation. Not just equal fragmentation, but racialized unequal fragmentation. And that was the driving vision that went to Codessa. And the compromise at Codessa was not to say that we are going to be a federalized state or that we are going to be a simple unitary state, but the compromise was a unitary state with provinces or a quasi-federal state. That was what we had decided on there, and the feelings around it and the thoughts around it were so strong 
that we built it into the Constitution that said that any change to that would require a two-thirds majority in the National Assembly, and no amount of referenda will be able to change that unless we are able to have it. But that is the political motivation for a unitary state. For me, it's a matter of simple math. We are a province, and these were the kind of realities we faced when we had these debates when I was in government and I was a premier, and, but it started with me being the Minister of Health and Welfare, later Economic Development, and I faced certain realities about the Western Cape when you felt fed up about how much money we're getting from national, et cetera, et cetera, and then you think, ah, when can't we just be on our own? We faced the reality, and I've updated the figures to 2021, um, figures of a province of 7 million people or 11% of the national population. You then ask, what does that province contribute in terms of tax to the national fiscus? The Western Cape has a total tax base of 62 billion. Gauteng has a tax base of 200 billion. We have 16% of taxpayers who contribute 15% to the fiscus whereas Gauteng contributes 49% to the fiscus and effectively subsidizes what happens in the Western Cape. Now, let's say we add to that, for example, customs duties that come through the port of Cape Town. That adds 23 billion or 11% of the national customs. At the same time, a harbor like Durban adds 100 billion or 46% to the import taxes. That's what we give to the national fiscus. What do we get from national? Our equitable share in the Western Cape, 72 billion. Remember, we contribute 62, we get 72 in equitable share. Add to that the conditional grant, which is 14 billion. Add to that the local government grant, which is a further, say about 7 billion. So we deal 93 billion from national to which we pay that 23 plus 62 billion in taxes. The fact of the matter is 40% of our people in the Western Cape are absolutely dependent on their SASA grants, whether it's the pensions, the disability grants, whether it is the child support grants or the distress grants. 40% of it comes directly out of the national fiscus at the rate of about 23 billion per month. Let's say 10% of that has to come from the province itself, multiply by 12. And so when you want, like I would tell my child, when he asserts his independence, I say, can you support yourself? If you can support yourself, then be independent. But while you are dependent on me, there are certain rules that apply okay. in this house. And therefore, I think feelings are one thing, Ideologies are another thing, political philosophies are another thing, but at the end of the day, what is the math? If we are upset, okay. like Fakey is, and like I am about national and the ANC, vote them out, don't secede. Okay. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you, Donald, uh, for organizing the debate, and thank you to my uh, fellow panelists. Um, the argument for Cape independence is based upon three incredibly simple and irrefutable truths. And as we'll probably see tonight, the argument against it is often to find as many ways as possible to complicate Cape independence in order to having to avoid these truths because they're so simple and they're so irrefutable. And, I, and tonight I hope that my job is to keep us focused on these three truths while perhaps my opponents will look to avoid talking about these three simple truths. So what are they? Number one, we've got problems. We've got big problems. Unemployment, poverty, crime, inequality, corruption, economic growth, electricity, government debt, bankrupt state enterprises, we could, we could go on. We've got problems. Number two, there's a fundamental difference between how the people of the Western Cape think we should address these problems and how the people of the rest of South Africa think we should address them. And this ideological divide between the Western Cape and the rest of South Africa has existed since the very beginning of our democracy. We've been here for 28 years and we never voted for the government that is destroying South Africa. And the third truth 
is that the people of the Western Cape, and here I disagree with Ibrahim's as assessment earlier, have an absolute right, a legal right, to determine their own future for themselves and decide how and by whom they're governed. And we've got these three simple truths. We've got problems, and that's a fact. There's a fundamental difference between the Western Cape and the rest of South Africa. It's a fact. And the people of the Western Cape have a right to determine their own future and not have it determined for them by a government they didn't elect and who they vehemently oppose. And that's a fact. And whilst we can never know for certain what the future holds, all of the evidence currently available to us indicates that the people of the Western Cape will do better when they're able to govern themselves. And even with a little bit of power that the province currently has, the Western Cape already outperformed South Africa by almost every possible objective measure. And Cape independence will significantly improve the lives of the people of the Western Cape. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Donald and Worldview, for organizing this important uh, discussion. I would like to also thank my fe fellow panelists in the audience. Um, you know, until I got your invitation to participate in this discussion, I was just um, pushing your idea as absolutely crazy and not even reading up on it. But I had to <coughs> begin to read up to prepare myself for, for, for this uh, panel discussion tonight. And I went into reading with a fairly open mind hoping that at the end of my reading, I would um, see things as you guys see them. And I, I did not become convinced. As Ibrahim says, um, I strongly believe that the people of South Africa are one. And uh, in your documents, you speak about the issue of language as one, a common language, as one of the unifying things or the criteria that makes it um, necessary or possible for Cape exit to, or the Cape to want to secede or to, to have um, independence. However, if we take Afrikaans, for instance, as a language or closer for that matter, Afrikaans is spoken throughout South Africa. It's not only, it's a, it's a truly South African language. So I was wondering when I was reading up, how are you going to determine which African speaking person will be legitimately allowed to belong to um, the independent or the seceded Cape? Because where I come from in Kimberley, on Sprat Africans, there's Mensa and Gauteng, but African Sprat. That's Mensa and Toando, but African Sprat. So as was net, the tal break. Then Almal, everybody can come into, claim their stake into the independent or the seceded Cape. That's the first thing. The, the issue of culture also. We share a, a, a common culture. There is no particular culture for people that are living in the Western Cape. Um, you also speak about the issue of currency and that you will peg it against um, uh, an international currency. You speak about the issues of borders and that intrigued me quite a lot because um, <coughs> it means um, I have family here in, in, in the Cape and I've been in the Cape for 22, 22 years and I have a family in Kimberley and in Gauteng. So when they want to come to visit me, to see me, it means they must cross into a new country. They must uh, clear custom. They must change currency and be able to, to visit me. I, I am not convinced. I think you have listed in your documents uh, countries that have seceded previously, like Finland seceded from Russia and all those things. But I also want to bring your attention to the problems between Russia and Ukraine that are affecting the world currently. And so don't look only at models that, were, that appear to have been uh, successful uh, when you look at them now, 200, 300 years down the line, and think that you could easily secede or demand independence. There are um, problems that will accompany repeatedly, like it has proven with uh, Ukraine and Russia, 
several times that there would be flare-ups, there would be wars. Right now, there is no prospect of war because of <coughs> cessation or uh, the demand for cessation. But generations down the line, that could be the issue. And coming to Connie Mulder's issue of membership of of 800,000 people that support um, independence or cessation, I want to juxtapose that with millions of South Africans who feel like I do, that 800,000 people, do they have the right to override millions of other people that feel that South Africa is one and it belongs to all of us together? And lastly, the solution for a failed state or for a corrupt state it's not to secede or, or independence. It is to vote, to work very hard to vote out the corrupt state. And um, yes, I think that is a very um, lazy, it's a lazy approach to dealing with a, the current endemic corruption, the failure of state, to think that you can just exit and um, your problems will be solved. Our problems and our successes are intertwined as, as South Africans. Okay. We must find solutions together. Thank, Thank you. you, Faiki. Let's give a round of applause. Right, today is actually a very auspicious day for those of you who are keeping up with world events because as the 23rd of June, 2022, today is exactly six years since the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom. So this has resulted in quite a lot of self-reflection by groups and role players on this, and the New European today published a list of Brexit achievements on its front page, which was in fact a completely blank page. What we've seen is huge problems in Scotland threatening to destroy a union of several hundred years, the election of Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland, and determination to pursue Irish unification and an exit from the UK altogether. There are deep divides across the UK that show no signs of being resolved. Two general elections, several administrations, with the latest one seriously challenged by a monk from the backbenches, uh, which is very indicative of the people who are not on the cabinet payroll being against the current leader. By-elections today in England, two of them, which they're probably going to lose, and we're seeing serious pressures on the current administration. The economic promises held out have not materialized. Certain industries have been devastated because of lack of mi migrant labor and staff. There's a shortage of truck drivers, and food prices are seriously rising. The legal migration between the UK and Europe may have stopped, but it has not stopped the illegal and informal migration from other countries. And this is merely the result of extracting themselves from a customs union. It's not actually secession from an independent country. Now, the Western Cape is seriously diverse. We have three different official languages. We have people who, as Fahri has said, have deep roots in other parts of the country. We have a shared history of struggle to build a better nation. But we also have a history of very, very deep division of a whole battle about identity. Who is a South African? Who is entitled to citizenship? Who can vote? Who can actually call themselves a South African in terms of a national government? These are something we've spent 28 years trying to eradicate, trying to build a common union, trying to build a common identity. To now roll that back and to return to those days of deep division and distrust is completely negative. Also, what we're seeing, unfortunately, is that people who support Wexit, and I mean, they're ent entirely entitled to their opinions, are not being entirely open and honest about the constitutional provisions. What we have in the Western Cape is our own constitution, which is not entirely in line with the national constitution. So before we can have a referendum, we need to amend the current constitution. Now, the Premier has indicated that that will happen. But whether or not that means he will then actually accede to having a referendum on this is an entirely different issue. What is also of importance is a referendum is not binding, okay? It is not a legal, um, it's not a legal mechanism. It is merely a political mechanism used to manage expectations. So let's say we actually have the referendum. We then have to see what's actually going to win. What is the majority of people actually going to vote? And quite frankly, with the greatest of respect, what we're seeing after 15 years of campaigning is only two seats in the current Cape Town administration. And I mean, the leader of the Cape Exit Party re resigned after his first meeting. So we really have to debate, is there genuinely that kind of support out there? Now, once there actually is a referendum, and if the majority of the Western Cape votes for it, it's not binding on the national government at all. So it doesn't even necessarily mean that is going to happen. 
Even if it were binding, it would mean when we need to have two-thirds of support in the National Assembly and six out of nine provinces in the NCOP to support it. And then there's the final issue that, frankly, secession is not a provincial matter. It is a national matter, and it affects everybody in this country. It's not just some people in the Western Cape who want to get away from the rest of the country. As Phil says, we do have problems. Yes, indeed, terrible problems. However, in the Western Cape, we do have the best-run government in the pro in provincial government in the country. There are huge differences as well between us and the rest of the country or between KwaZulu-Natal and the rest of the country. You can argue that there are differences anywhere. But that's not a reason to secede. It's not a reason to break up a unitary country. I mean, finally, in terms of a legal right to self-determination and expression, that is something that could be completely encompassed within the current situation of devolved powers in the provinces and in metros, which we're seeing the Premier and the Mayor in the city of Cape Town pushing to a very large extent. And that is by far the better option than a destructive breakup of a unitary country. Thank you. I just want to ask a quick question. I understand everyone's position here except the de Democratic Alliances. So there's currently a bill pending in Parliament that would allow the, the, the Premier of the Western Cape to call a referendum. If that bill were to pass, will the Premier call a referendum? I'm just confused as to why. I mean, you're, you're very vocal on your, your, um, your antagonistic against this entire approach of Cape Independence. Why are you then pursuing this independence referendum bill in Parliament? Okay, so currently, because the Western Cape has its own constitution, unlike the other provinces, it does raise certain issues. That's why, for example, in the Western Cape, there are ministers rather than just MECs. So currently, the Premier is not able to call, it, cause, call a referendum. There are sort of desires within the provincial government to now amend the constitution in various ways. That is one of the things. But remember that a referendum on independence is not the only thing that needs to be debated. The DA's view is that what we need to do is devolve powers down to the provinces. And having referendums, although they're not legally binding, would then potentially have persuasive power on various issues. But will you call a referendum on independence if that bill were to pass? Well, that would be, that would be within the, the decision of the Premier to make that. I'm not in the provincial government, I'm in the national government. Okay, thank you. At least you're being honest. I want to move to a more conversational debate round. Two minutes max, if we can. And um, I guess, full Craig, if you want to respond, also guess, if you want to approach the subject, please let me know with a raise of the hand. If you want to comment, please let the conversation keep flowing. Don't raise irrelevant matters or questions. Thank you. Um, look, I'm really glad. And there's one specific issue I think I'd just love to put to bed and I'd like to put it to bed definitively. And I think it's unfortunate. I think one of the things that's really important is that we get to understand the legal situation around Cape Independence because with respect, a lot of the things that have been said just are not the, the case. First of all, the Western Cape Constitution does have a provision for the Premier to call a referendum. It's 37.2F. It's the Referendum Act that's, that's not, and it predates the Constitution, but that's not the main issue. There's, this is the main issue that somehow South Africa can prevent secession. In other words, it doesn't matter what the people of the Western Cape want because the rest of South Africa can somehow through the constitution can prevent that. So what I'm going to do is I've, I've, I've got a section here I'm going to read. This has already been debated internationally and it was debated in the case when Quebec wanted to unilaterally secede from Canada and the Canadian Supreme Court had the same situation of the constitution and what rights existed and actually global experts from around the world would call in. So this particular issue has already played out, and I want to read what this Canadian Constitutional Court, and interestingly enough, the, the Canadian Constitutional Court found that, the, that Quebec already had self-determination. Uh, and they said they already had self-determination because the, the Prime Minister of Canada for, for the last 40 or 50 years had come from Quebec. So even though Quebec had self-determination, this is what the, the, the Supreme Court of Canada said. The continued existence and operation of the Canadian constitutional order could not be indifferent to a clear expression of a clear majority of Quebecers that they no longer wish to remain in Canada. The other provinces and the federal government would have no basis to deny the right of the government of Quebec to pursue secession, should a clear majority of the people of Quebec choose that goal, so long as in doing so, Quebec respects the right of others." The negotiations that followed such a vote would address the potential act of secession, as well as its possible terms should in fact secession proceed. There would be no con conclusions predetermined by law on any issue. Negotiations would need to address the interests of other provinces, the federal government, Quebec, 
and indeed the rights of all Canadians both within and outside Quebec, and specifically the rights of minorities. No one suggests that it would be an easy set of negotiations. Do you want to remain of part of South Africa and allow the rest? No! Or do you want to form a new sovereign state and create Africa's first? It's been decided, it's clear. The rest of South Africa cannot prevent secession, it can negotiate it, and the, the Constitution, whatever the provisions are, cannot be used to, to, to wipe out the democratic will okay. of the Western Cape people. Just very quickly on the issue of running a country or a society by referenda. I think Benedicta has spoken on the issue of Brexit. I think that there's buyer's remorse um, that is very strong on that side. But of, often, what you have with referenda is the test of what is populist and what is emotional at a particular time. We did not, for example, accede as a government and as a political party at the time to the idea of a referendum on the death penalty because the constitution is the arbiter between your anger at a particular moment and what is the right values for a society. Now, I think if we open up the debate on running a country by referenda, in Afrikaans you say, you make a lot for your ear Because at the same time, imagine the EFF comes to power or gets enough power to call a referendum on land expropriation. You then begin to lay the foundation for greater problems in a country like South Africa. And so you can say that this is what we want for ourselves and it's binding, but then remember what the consequences are of it. Open a door for one thing and a whole lot of undesirable stuff come rushing through. Thank you, Abhi Ibrahim. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Sanet Kollar. I'm from Cape Exit NPO, not a political party. And I just want to get two facts straight. Number one, we are not in the city of Cape Town because we are not a political party. Okay, that is CIP, Cape Independence Party. Nothing to do with us. Cape Exit is a non-political civic action group with actually 826,625 members at the moment. Okay, as from today. 128,000 Facebook members, active Facebook members. And 62% of the DA voters that is part of our membership. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. No, I think it's getting interesting now. I am under the impression that Ibrahim, although he's an independent or not an independent, an individual in that sense, but Ibrahim still, to a certain extent, represents the ANC in my mind, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't think that I would be in a meeting like this where the ANC and the DA agrees. And they do, they do, they do. They agree on being against independence for the Cape, and they agree that they are together against the referendum. So we must take note of that. The second thing is this. It's also a reality that the majority, the vast majority of supporters of Cape Exit have in the past voted for the Democratic Alliance. And they must take note of that reality, that what they support, those things are not supported by the DA. So if they've got a problem in two years' time with that position, then those voters should just change their allegiance and vote for political parties that support Cape independence and that support the idea of a referendum. I find it strange that the Democratic Alliance is prepared to bring a bill to Parliament. It's not there yet. Um, they say it's there, but it's not there. It's, on, it's, it's not there. To make a referendum possible. I've also heard what is being said about referendums. Um, I won't chuck referendums out so easily. There's a little country in Europe. It's called Switzerland. It's quite a successful place. They use referendums quite often. Why? To get what is in the mind and the hearts of the people that are there, the voters, to vote. So, if there's a referendum to be, to be held in, in the Western Cape, I think it's uh, the necessary thing to do to hear what the people are saying. And we are not saying that the referendum is binding. Obviously, it's not. But you have to take cognizance of the views of the people. Let me just add something else. I've heard just now 
And Abraham's arguments are all based on the economic situation, saying in terms of the taxes, etc., etc. We will have to have a different discussion on that issue because my figures are completely different from the figures that you have. It's exactly the opposite. But we'll get to that point as well. Faiki, you made the point about South Africa belongs to all of us. Okay. That's the wonderful quote that comes from the Freedom Charter. If something belongs to me as well, then surely I should have a say about that. And we have had not had a say since 1994. The majority has decided on our behalf what our children will learn in school, how the taxes will be paid, how the money should be spent, etc., etc. It creates okay, a huge nice. problem. I'm only getting started. Thank you. <laughs> Benedicta, Benedicta. So sorry. That's very, that's very kind of you, Cornel. I think you want the right to reply. <laughs> <laughs> but let, <laughs> but let me let me reply to your quirk about ANCDA agreement. From my side, I would say, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, sorry, sir. But where, where I, I, I think what we need to understand, this thing about the endowments of the Western Cape. We must not praise something that was racialized in the past. This Cape Town is the one place where within a radius of 25 kilometers of four academic hospitals, of five universities, now there are four because some have been amalgamated, and therefore, and the bulk of the civil servants with experience were here. When I was premier, I was not suicidal. It was how to transform that into something that was good for the country and how to work with national, and that's why we were able to get a growth rate of 5.8%. For Dagmark rate, challenging is not the way to get cooperation going. To get the Potsdam interchanges, the Kuburg interchanges done, you have to seduce national to the party and to get those kind of things done. So I'm saying you don't break away until you have broken bread. And I think that the culture of a Dagmakre is the one that we must watch out again. So I'm saying when you are sick and tired to the point that you have tried everything and it hasn't worked, and the most important thing to try, make the 2024 election a referendum. Let the Cape Independent Party stand and say, we stand for the secession, contest for provincial um, power, and say, this is all who agree with independence, secession, federalism, whatever, vote for us. And if you get a majority, treat that as your, as your point to, to test. Okay. But, don't, um, but don't be afraid of the voters. Right. By testing it in an election by taking the shortcut of a referendum. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you very much. So the national constitution certainly does recognize self-determination, but it recognizes the self-determination within the territory of South Africa. Now, that can take many different forms. What we're seeing in the Western Cape with the Democratic Alliance is pushing for the devolution of powers down to the province and down to the city. That is something that can be done in terms of the constitution. It is something that is entirely possible. It is something that we are, to a very large extent, not only succeeding at, but continuing to push as well. You also see within DA policy, the DA is the only party in this country that actually recognizes the concept of agency within all our policy and legislation. So when it comes to things like, for example, schools, we recognize the fact that the school governing body, along with the parents, who determine what happens at that school. It's the same with land policy. It's recognizing agency of people. We're not deciding for people. We're putting the choices in their hands. And that carries through as well to in the future, if we do do referenda, is to looking what people are thinking. Whether or not there would be one on Cape Independence is something that would still need to be discussed. And as I've already said to Phil, there is the small issue. You'd actually need to have a majority of people supporting it. And quite frankly, from where I'm sitting and from the position of a DA, we certainly don't see that happening at this point. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Frank Abuba. Um, I would like to use just a little bit of an illustration, uh, you know, to talk about why we, you know, why I'm against the exiting. Let's say South Africa was a cruise boat post-1994. Yeah, it's a beautiful boat, you know, with beautiful pools and malls and it's a floating home. And then suddenly we hit an iceberg and everybody wants to jump ship into another cruise boat. 
Why do you want to do that when we can fix it? We can work together, especially now that we've got an opportunity. There's a great opportunity to, to make it happen. 2024, it's around the corner and we can do it. It's very, it's possible. We've overlooked that. We've, looked, we've, we've waited 28 years. You know, whose fault is it? 28 years you continue to, you know, to allow this to happen. We should blame ourselves. Um, exiting Cape is an emotional decision. I believe so. I would, you know, I would agree. But, you know, if you have to look at it in the real sense, it shouldn't happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I also find myself agreeing with, with for the DA that um, constitutionally, you, for, for this thing to pass, unfortunately, it can't only be the uh, inhabitants of the Cape, their feelings, their emotions that are the final arbitrage of whether they will exit or not. The constitution precisely says that this must be taken to representatives of the country, which is the National Assembly, which is 75% and six provinces. So we may, you may even succeed in getting a referenda, referendum. And referendum, referenda are very emotive, we all know that. And as Ibrahim Rasul says, um, the, the EFF we know has got an ability to whip emotions. Tomorrow it might not only be the issue of land, it might, it might be the, the, the issue of open our borders for everybody to come in. So you, you don't really, I'm not, I'm not opposed to testing the feeling and the emotions of the people resident in the Cape in terms of whether they want to um, become independent or what, but that is, that is the first step. That will be the first step. The very last step, the most important constitutional step is will South Africans, broader South Africans as represented by National Assembly, will they agree? And I doubt that they will agree. To give you some background, I saw this unmitigated disaster coming. I took my family out of this country in 1994, 1905 actually. And I was right. It is an unmitigated disaster. The ANC has just destroyed everything in this country. There's nothing left of it. You could set your watch on the railway trains arriving at the station. They don't run anymore. We built our own jets, our own weaponry. You know what? We had a nuclear weapon. Doesn't exist anymore. You tell me one government institution that's still functioning today, and I'll give you all the money I have. I don't have much, but I'll give you everything. You can't. It does not exist. For the panel members, with the exception of Dr. Mulder and Mr. Craig, I suggest you go and read the South African Constitution, International Law, and the United Nations Charter. We have every right to secede. And you know what? We're going to. DA, you're on your way out. You're not going to survive. <laughs> what the hell do you stand for? What do you stand for? I'm here four years in this country. I cannot wait to get out. But before I leave, I spoke to my son the other day. He's in South Carolina. And we were talking about the Cape Independence thing. He said, Dad, I'll be back tomorrow with my family. My son in Florida, the same thing. They'll be back tomorrow. And I think I speak for millions of South Africans overseas. They'll be back tomorrow. So let's do this damn thing. Let's support the Freedom Front. They support Mr. Craig and his organization. You guys got to get your stuff together. Otherwise, this is the final song for you. Thank you. Mikey, you've just now said that you should be careful of referendums because who knows the AFF may come with a referendum to open the borders. I don't want to burst your bubble. The borders have been open for 28 years. You should see what's happening in South Africa and the people are just coming and flooding in from across the world. And we've got to pay for that and we've got to make it possible. And Dicta referred to the constitution and self-determination. Yes, section 235. I had the privilege to propose that. That's my wording, that's in the constitution. Of course we know 
that the current constitution, section 235, does not make provision for secession in that sense. I know that. Before 1994, the ANC said to the National Party, we want one person, at that stage it was one man, one vote. Now it's one person, one vote. And we want the Bill of Rights in a unitary state. What did the National Party say? No, cannot be done. It's not in line with the Constitution. We will not accept it. What did the ANC do? Did you say because they say it can't be done, you've relinquished your ideal? No. You struggled even more so. So I know what the Constitution says, and I know that what is being said in terms of these provisions and 75% and six provinces, etc., that may be so. Independence for the Cape will hopefully happen, and, and that's just my view. What is the first price? Independence in terms of an internationally recognized settlement or agreement. That's the first price, and that is what we are working towards. But trust me when I tell you that not the Constitution or nothing in that vein will prevent the will of the people if they decide that they want to go in a certain way. You can, you can come along and say the Constitution says you're not allowed to do that. We saw what happened in KZN last year. People will say, well, I've got some rights in terms of the Bill of Rights. Where, 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 what happened to the Bill of Rights during that, react, that situation? The Constitution is not there for the people to serve. The Constitution must serve the will of the people. It must be a part and parcel of what is in the hearts and the minds of the people that it's supposed to represent. Now, the problem is at the moment, <clears throat> yes, I'm working on a daily basis to get rid of the ANC government. It's not, a, it's not a secret. That's what I'm doing. We've succeeded in certain metros in Gauteng. We took 162 billion out of the hands of the ANC by forming coalition governments. We are going to do the same in 2024 on a national level. That's what we are working towards. If we succeed in doing that, then we have a chance to steer South Africa in a different direction. But it's not going to be easy. Why? Because we don't have a normal democracy. Each and every day, the ANC and the EFF are trying to subvert those governments up north, which elected democratically. So we had today, again, where there was an attempt of a motion of no confidence in the speaker, which we defeated. We don't have a normal democracy. Okay. <laughs> I think one thing we should just be clear is we all understand that Cape Independence wasn't most of our first choices. It's an act of last resort. And I want to just come back on, on some of the solutions that people are throwing out around the table. Fakie says, well, if you don't like the government, vote it out. Well, for 28 years, we never voted it in. We're trying to vote it out. We've tried for 28 years to vote it out. We can't because the system is fixed and we cannot vote them out because the rest of South Africa, who's more populous than us, dictates who the government is and we get to swallow what's left. Fix South Africa. Well, we're who are we trying to fix South Africa? We can't fix South Africa because Africa's going backwards. Okay, but we can fix the Western Cape. We're going to devolve powers. What powers have you devolved? You can't even get control of the police. You've asked for control of the police and the police minister says, no, we're not going to give it to you. We want to fix the railways. No, you can't have it. You can't even get the basic powers. And if we can't get control of economic policy, if we can't get control of taxation, if we can't dictate that and govern the province according to the ideology that the people of, of voters of the province want, we can't fix it. And 2024, my goodness, the ANC at 51%, I would take any day of the week over the ANC at 45%. And heaven knows who they're going to end up in a coalition with and what deals are going to get done. And we, we, we struggle to call together coalitions in everywhere around the country. They're a disaster. Every politician I talk to says to me, coalition, governments, my goodness. 2024 isn't salvation of South Africa. It's the last, it's the last hurdle. It's the last destruction of South Africa and chaos is going to reign. But let's not pretend that somehow th that there's some magic solution. Cape independence is an act of last resort, but that is where we are. We're at last resort. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm against the independence, uh, the Cape independence. And reason being, I believe so much that this country has a lot to offer, number one. And my belief in the Cape Independence is that it's taking us backwards rather than forward. It's a few individuals, which is yes in numbers if you're over 800,000, it's a lot of you. But will that mean, are we in a democratic state where we really say majority? Or are we saying only because you, certain people, want to independence and then let's go for that? And in that independence, what more is it opening up for? Then uh, Mr. Rasul also indicated that but if EFF comes tomorrow and say, now we need actually to take this land, let's put it in the referendum. Let's, put, let's, let's, let's make independence on that. 
I mean, there's a lot of things that may come out of that. But at the current moment, 2024 is only our hope in salvaging this country. And I believe in 2024, people have seen the rot that is in the ANC, and they are ready actually to take ANC out. That is no doubt. The only thing that they kept independence and any other political party should do right now is to make sure that we educate our people in terms of how bad it is to vote for the ANC. Irrespective of you think it is your government, but it is actually not. For a quick example, right now you'll find that the poor people, the poorest of the poor, those are the people that are voting for the ANC. But is that the ANC that is working for them? No, it's not. But our people, they lack the education. They don't understand the power that they have of voting out the ANC. ANC has lied to them and they continue to lie to them. And then that is why they continue to vote even today. Thank you. It's not only the poorest of the poor that keep on propping up the ANC for 28 years from victory, victory to victory. It is also the us that are so enlightened, that are so articulated, articula yes, articulative, that are so well read that um, we have not really demanded, yes, you are right, for 28 years we could not vote the ANC out, but simply because the electoral system is faulty. It has been designed to ensure that you cannot vote out the ANC because we are voting in a party, we are not voting in individuals, we are not voting in the president directly. So let us change the system, let us work together to change the system. It doesn't help to complain to say that it's not working, it has not worked for 28 years, I'm out of here, I want to be independent. Apart from blaming the poor that because they get food parcels and 350, some of them, around every election, what have we done? Those of us that has the means, the might, and the capability to demand the change of the electoral system so that it, it delivers that which we want it to deliver to all of us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I always find it interesting that in the one province that actually really works, there is this attempt to essentially undermine and dismantle it. I think to use Frank's analogy is actually quite destructive. It is a case of being on a ship that is hitting an, ice, an iceberg. But the point is that that ship is not being steered just by one captain. For the last 28 years, it has essentially been steered by everybody in this country. And I think we really need to understand that for some people to then leap off the ship, jump in a life raft, and go off into the sunset, is really not assisting the country as a whole. And we do all as South Africans have a responsibility to make the country as a whole work. What is very, very concerning is when you go, and I'm on Scopa at Parliament, so we go to a lot of the smaller municipalities that have the most appalling audit records. They really are shocking. But what happens come the election, the people who are there, who are suffering under that municipality, vote for the ANC again because they don't see alternatives or they don't really under possibly understand that alternatives can happen. What we need to do, rather than destroying the system, is quite frankly to work to educate people across the country as to what the alternatives are, and there are several alternatives. Something like independence, breaking down hard-won freedoms in this country is really not the way to go forward. So we really have to look sensibly at what the other alternatives are, and you don't run away from a country just because they're problems. People in America didn't run away because there were problems. What did they do? They reorganized and they vote differently the next time. That is something we should be doing in this country as well. This tendency to have self-determination because we know our group is different to everybody else, so we want to govern ourselves. That's not the way. That is simply going to destroy everything. And we really have to look at voting differently to ensure a different future. And that is what we're doing in the Western Cape. And that is why we have the best indicators economically here versus the other provinces. Thank you. A comment from the audience? All right, I'm no, no political bulldog or whatever. But here tonight, what we've established, we've got us, we all have a common problem. And the problem is the government. And there's no other way we're going to get rid of them is to vote them out. We're fighting each other. We should be fighting them. We're putting all our energy in, in fighting each other. What the hell? We've got this million small political parties. The ANC love it. They love it. We all vote da, 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 da. All our votes, choof, boof, in the bin. And I'm getting really excited about it.
The ANC loves it. One ANC, yeah, everybody votes for them. We, traditional African, South African, here, the outrack, die come to, die outrack, die come to, we don't stand together. We have to get together. We have to stand together. Nelson Mandela, have you heard that name ever since in the last 10 years? Yeah. No. Because Nelson Mandela said, and he's no fan of mine, make no mistake. He said, if a government does to you what apartheid has done to you, vote them out. Let's support Mandela. Yeah. Let's vote them out. How? Yeah. Yeah. Stand yeah. together. Both. Avoid okay. this million okay. small parties. Okay. Let us start getting okay. together. You are wrong. I'll tell you now why you are wrong. I'll come back to it just now. Fakey, you want to change the electoral system. Don't do that. If we change the electoral system, the ANC will govern another 20 years. Trust me. Trust me. Because if you change the electoral system, do you think the government will change it in such a way that they will lose power? No, they won't. People quite often say we want constituencies. If we go to constituencies, the ANC will have 80% of those constituencies. The current system, the electoral system, favors what we want to achieve because it's strictly proportional. What we need to understand is one single party is not going to defeat the ANC. Not today, not tomorrow. But coalitions of different parties coming together in a coalition have already defeated the ANC in the city of Johannesburg, in the city metro of Tswane, in the city of Ekuruleni. We're going to do that very recent, soon in, in the city of Nelson Mandela Bay and others as well. That is what the system makes possible in terms of coalitions. I understand what you're saying in terms of so many parties. We've got more than 400 political parties in South Africa. 95% of them is me, my wife, the dog, and a fax machine. It means nothing. It means nothing. No, no, no. No, they don't. 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 They can't pay the. They can't even pay the deposit of almost 800,000 rand to participate. No. A coalition is the answer because if, if you want to win it in terms of an election. Because then a party, a, a electorate can vote for the party of their choice, knowing that they will work together in a coalition afterwards. That's what's happening at the moment. We're going to have a coalition government in the Western Cape in 2024. You can write it down. I can promise you that. It's going to happen in other places as well. I've heard from two or more people here the, uh, the, uh, the example of the passenger ship that ran into the iceberg. I think it was called the Titanic. <laughs> well, I watched that movie. They did everything that they could to save the boat. It went down. Secondly, it's no use the Western Cape is the presidential suite on the Titanic. When the Titanic went down, the presidential suite went down with the Titanic. If you are in a federal kind of a situation, and I know, let me give you a small example with regard to, to devolvement of, of powers. At Parliament, we, we had an argument to say Parliament should have its own political po police service that we can take charge of the precinct. Like you've got in the Vatican, where there's a police force that take charge of the Vatican, and they then give, if people do something wrong, they will hand them at the gate to the South African police. We brought in <laughs> Minister Tswele, Biki Tswele was there, and we explained it to him in the Chief Whips Forum. What did he say? Oh, no. South African police will police each and every inch of South Africa and will control it from where? Tswane. That's what's happening. Look at the provincial commissioner. The Western Cape has got no say in appointing the provincial commissioner of police in this province. It's decided on national level. Okay. As long as you've got a situation where you can't take your own decisions, you are under the auspices of the national government. Okay. Yes, we will do the one and we will do the other as well. Final point. It's not a question, independence is not a question of either or. It's not the independence or nothing else. It's and, and. We won't need hard borders if we have a friendly part of South Africa up north without the ANC. It will be like the European Union. But we need to go that route because without that, independence is not a nice to have, it's a necessity to survive in Africa. Yeah, thank you, Cornet. You know, like a spectator watching this debate for dissatisfied people you are of the most despairing depressed people because you are going for the option of breaking away when all of you describe the state of the country 
the collapse of the ANC and the impending doom for a party like the ANC. If the ANC itself is worried about, and I'm not giving inside secrets, about what will happen in 2024, they know December 22 is the watershed and 2024 election is the crossroads. It's like people looking at this but lacking the political analysis, full of fury, sound and fury, but lacking the political analysis to say, what do we do? You've got the pre-programmed answer, secede or go independent. What is absent is the political strategy that we used against the National Party to say, shift the balance of force. You see, the difficulty you have because if you look on the right side of the ANC, the ceiling is 28%. On the left side of the ANC, the ceiling is 10 On the right side, Freedom Front, the DA has gobbled up much of that space. On the left side, it started off as APU, PAC, it then became UDM, it then became COPE, it then became EFF. But it stays 10%. Your gap is not to feed off each other. Go and persuade those who stayed away from the ANC and moved it from 66% down to 50%, uh, 58% in the last election. It means go and speak to black people. Not against. Don't be perceived to be against. Go and speak to them and say there is an alternative. But if you don't have the language, if you don't have the attitude, if you don't have the humility, if you don't have the ability to speak that language, you will forever remain a depressed, despairing minority. Okay. And then you deserve what comes your way. Thank you, Ibrahim. Nonsense. I kind of wanted to bring this back because we've talked a lot about politics now here. And I wanted to bring this just back to the last point, which is actually about the people of the Western Cape. And I'm glad you've talked about it because this, this isn't a movement of white people. This is a movement of people from the Western Cape, which has multiracial support, and it would be dependent upon a democratic mandate from the majority of the people in the Western Cape. And I want to just bring it back to the human angle and say, look, forget the politics, forget the party politics. We, we have got people living in abject poverty, who are, who, who are suffering chronic unemployment, who are dying sooner than they're supposed to die. And that is a consequence of the government that they didn't elect. And actually, we have to save actual people. I've, I've got some figures here, you know, to make a comparison. Uh, South Africa unemployment, 46.2%. The Western Cape, 30.3. And we often think that the Western Cape is doing better than the rest of South Africa. And it is. But it's doing atrocious compared to the rest of the world. I took a comparison here. The UK, 3.8%. US, 3.6%. Murder rate, 34 out of 100,000 in South Africa. 58 out of 100,000 in the Western Cape. Nearly double. One out of 100,000 in the UK and five out of 100,000 in the... We have, our people are living in terrible conditions. Millions in shacks without work. Dependent, I mean, actually, dependent on grants is ridiculous because actually they're dependent on grants because they haven't got jobs. And they're the things that we've got to fix. So let's not lose the human angle of Cape independence. Actually, it's about saving the province for the people. And, and the people of the Western Cape cannot be held hostage to, to the voters in other provinces who make bad decisions. They say never divorce a fool from the consequences of their own actions. The rest of South Africa is governed by the government it voted for. And if they've made stupid choices, and they clearly have, then they have to be responsible for their own choices. They can't drag us down with them. We have 7 million people and we have to uplift those and they're coloured and they're black and they're white and those seven million people need to be governed according to their democratic will so they can be lifted out of poverty so they aren't living in shacks, they aren't unemployed, they don't have terrible education, health care and all of the issues that they're suffering with as human beings who deserve better. Thank you Paul. Okay, one sentence. He spoke about the seven million people. I promise you, those 7 million people will not vote yes for the exit. That's number one. Number two, we have identified the cancer of this country. You know, this country, for 28 years, we've allowed it to happen. I said that before. You know, we've got an opportunity to change it. We can change it. We can do it. We can fix it. 
Um, personally, no, no, hang, uh, yeah. yeah. Personally, I've been working. You know, um, I'm not a politician, but in the last 19 months, I've been so political. You know, um, because I, I, I joined Action SA. Um, you know, and I know we can fix it. For my kids, for my children, I, you know, I, I listened to his accent as well. We probably came from the same background, becoming South Africans. This is our country. We love our country. We can do it. We're going to do it. It's happening. Look, watch the news. ANC is going to disintegrate. They are gone. They're not going to govern us in 20, uh, post 2024. Yeah. That's for sure. Mark my word. Frank Abuba. Thank you. One of the previous speakers, I, I'm not sure if it was Phil O'Connor, talked about we're not a normal democracy. And I've been sitting here trying to think to myself, who is currently a normal democracy? And I can't actually think of anywhere at all. All countries are different. All countries are unique. They have a lot of similar problems. They also have a lot of unique problems. So essentially, you know, no one is special over and above anybody else in that regard. Nowhere is a normal democracy. What we have is what we have to work with. And quite honestly, you know, if one's talking about a referendum, and it's, it's easy to sit here and say that Cape Exit is, is different ideologically or is not different ideologically to the Cape Independence Party. It's easy to say, oh, no, we're not them. And it's also easy to say that we run polls and our support is X or our support is Y. At the end of the day, the only poll that matters is the one that happens at the ballot box. And quite frankly, in the eyes and the minds of the people of Cape Town, the Cape Independence Party and Cape Exit are the same grouping. One can say one's a non-political, non which is debatable, non-political party. One can say one's a pressure group. At the end of the day, in the eyes of the voter in the ballot box, it is considered to be the same. And frankly, the Cape, the Cape Independence Party, after 15 years of campaigning, won a single seat for their leader, Jack Miller. And after the first council meeting, he resigned. They still had that one seat, and now with a couple of recounts, they've managed to add what we tend to refer to as the lucky loser seat, which is the remainder of the votes in Cape Town. So they now have two seats. That's after 15 years. Quite honestly, you can say what you like in rooms to each other. You can congratulate yourselves on what you believe. But let me tell you, at the end of the day, out there, if there were to be a referendum, you would not be able to win that. So what you need to do is start discussing what your alternatives are. What would happen if you had a referendum and you didn't win? What then? Where would you take what you believe in? You have to think of alternatives. Those alternatives are provincial. Those are actually looking at what we're doing now, devolving power down, having pressure groups, doing what we're doing in the Western Cape, which has by far the best indicators across the country. And that really is the only viable alternative at this point. And one needs to start looking at educating voters to vote out the ANC so that we actually have a government that is responsible for actually developing the country. Thank you. Thank you. This us and them, us being the people of the West, uh, West Cape and them being the majority South Africans, it's bad. It's awful, it tastes bad, it looks bad. Those are my closing remarks. Thank you. I think for many of us, if we're honest, we, we already know that Cape Independence will produce the best outcome for the people of the Western Cape. Some people want to know it's okay to say so, but others want to know how it can be done and whether it can be done. But I want to use my closing argument to directly address the political party in whose hands the future of every single person in the Western Cape lies, and that's the DA. And as the province, we've put our faith in your party for three straight terms. And I don't know if you know the story of the little Dutch boy who saved his village by putting a finger in the dike and then sat there for the whole day until help could arrive, until the dike could be fixed. Well, in the Western Cape, the DA is that little boy. You've saved our village from the disaster that awaits us if the dike bursts. And you've been heroic and we're all in the debt of the DA but you haven't fixed anything. You're holding back impending disaster for as long as you possibly can. And in a hundred years, without Cape independence, Western Cape culture as we know it will no longer exist. The white people will all be gone. 
The coloured people will be forced into choosing between a civil war or subjugation to an African culture which is alien to them. And the black people who've escaped the collapse of South Africa by migrating to the Western Cape will have been enveloped by everything they ran away from in the first place. And the Western Cape didn't elect Jews so that you could use your votes to bolster your party political ambitions on the national stage, where outside of the Western Cape, only 16% of voters want you. And it's infuriating to hear sometimes the DA party leaders declaring that 75% of our voters or 70% of our voters live outside the Western Cape, because 100% of the voters who voted the DA in this province live inside of it. And what kind of federal party anyway aggregates its support over different jurisdictions? That's the antithesis of federalism. And history is going to judge the DA for what they do next. Will they continue to be Esau and sell the birthright of the Western Cape people for a bowl of ANC soup? Will they be remembered along with Chamberlain as the greater appeasers who tried to reason and placate Nazi imperialism? Will they be like Nero, who continue to fiddle as Rome burns, asking very nicely if we could just be allowed to govern our own police force, whilst 10 people every day are being murdered in the Western Cape? Or will you take the opportunity and deliver the ultimate autonomy to the people of the Western Cape? Not just the power to run the police and the railways and to generate a little bit of electricity, but the power to set economic policy the power to lock up corrupt ministers and politicians and to keep them there once you've locked them up, the power to spend our own tax money on the people of the Western Cape, on the things that are important to us, the power to liberate our economy and create jobs for the people of the Western Cape, the power to create world-class housing, world-class education and world-class hospitals, and the power to control our own borders. And I'm talking about sovereign power in the independent Western Cape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that this was a, an interesting debate. And I think that there are a few references that leave me worried. The one about leaving in 94, not being a fan of Mandela, and we will return if you have independence. The other one is about the Western Cape not having an alien African culture imposed on them. And the other one is the comparison with Nazi dictatorship. I think those, those are extreme demands and, and statements. And I think it confirms a lingering doubt about what we are dealing with. We're all familiar with the four trekkers. I'm worried about the idea of independence being for the terugtrekkers. Because if I, and I checked it out today, 52% of new bonds being registered by banks in places like Hermanus, Constantia, um, and other southern suburbs areas, George, and so forth, 52% of them are from suburbs in Johannesburg, who feel like you. And so, and so the point, we can understand why, but it puts a particular onus on the independence to de-racialize and to non-racialize. And that is the test that you have to pass. Speaking about African culture being alien is the indictment that you should never entertain and allow into what should be a good debate about the future. I'm saying it is a sign of your insecurity that you want a referendum on independence rather than contest an election on that basis and win it. You can snipe at the DA and I love that, <laughs> but it, it shows to me that you want to feed off the base of the DA. And that is as worrying. So I think maybe Courtney, you need to give leadership to this dissatisfaction because you are not strongly secessionist and you are definitely unhappy. But I think this movement needs political acumen to go forward. And so I'm very happy that you restate the problems, but you've not solved the fiscal issues that confront you directly. We can say we must convert 
grants and social security to jobs. But until that has happened, who will find the, the three billion a month to pay those grants or, and, 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 or dismantle the safety net? Those are the practical challenges, the fiscal challenges, the emotions are good, the philosophy we can bring from Quebec and all over Upper Austria, etc. We can bring all of that. But if you don't solve the practical financial and fiscal problems that go with it, it's a non-starter. And so I leave here very relaxed that South Africa is not in danger from you. I leave here very relaxed that the integrity of our country remains intact. I leave here very relaxed that what I've heard is sound and fury, but no thought and strategy. And so please continue the way you're going because that means that we can get on with a job. Myself, inside, Feiki, outside, everyone outside, to make sure that 2022 is a decisive year, as a reg of weg. And Cyril must find his courage to do what must be done, and to make sure that if it doesn't, then 2024 will be in the hands of the voters. I even think that there will be sufficient black voters who may be so disillusioned that they may make an alternative choice. At this point, I don't think you are part of that choice menu. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibrahim. Racist ship has sailed. Stop that nonsense. I am also going to leave here tonight very relaxed <laughs> for the simple reason that the ANC and the DA is not seeing what is coming. And that suits me perfect. You do not understand what's happening in the Western Cape. You do not understand what is going to happen in the rest of South Africa. Abraham is absolutely correct, <clears throat> and I can assure you that this whole idea and this notion is not built on emotion or on a lot of uh, hot air. It's being thought through, and it's inevitable. You can try to prevent it, you will not succeed. You can try to delay it, you may succeed, you will not stop it, you will not prevent it. The question is how we're going to implement and how we're going to do that going forward. And you're correct. It's about the balance of power. We understand that. That's what the ANC did. We learned a lot from the ANC. We took the positives. Um, there were some before 1994. And we've learned from that, and we will implement that as well. <clears throat> so, the point made earlier with regard to the Cape Independence Party and uh, Cape Exit, the NPO, is not something that we can go about lightheartedly. There's total difference between those two uh, organizations. It's not the same thing at all. And if anyone is under the impression that the support that the Cape Independence Party received up to this point is an indication of what's happening at the moment, you're also in for a big, big surprise. Cape Exit, the real Cape Exit, has not flexed its muscle yet. So, the referendum the people putting these things on the table are not stupid. We will never call for a referendum unless we know we're going to win that referendum. You're not going to participate to lose. Trust me, the day when we call for a referendum, you should be very worried. Trust me. But in the meantime, there's an election in 2024. And the people and the electorate in the Western Cape must take note of that, and they must flex their muscle in voting for political parties that support independence for the Western Cape. The Freedom Front Plus is such a party. We are such a party that will go full out for independence of the Western Cape. And we're putting that on the table. We will put that in our agenda. We'll put that in our manifesto in 2024. And then there's the problem of what's going to happen. Things are changing in the Western Cape itself. Of the 25 local governments in the Western Cape at the moment, the DA is only governing in nine of those on their own. Only nine. Why? Because they fell below 50% in the 2021 election in all the others. There we have coalition governments. Freedom Front Plus is in eight of those coalition governments with the DA at the moment. So, what's going to happen in 2024 on provincial level? I'm telling you tonight that we will also have a coalition government in the Western Cape. And do you think we are going to go into that government without what we've got in mind? No, we are not. I've said in the beginning, the ultimate aim is a negotiated, agreed settlement. Abraham is referring to December 2022 and we're hoping that Cyril will be re-elected 
and that he will then take the right decisions. I've watched the ANC now for 28 years in Parliament and in politics. The downfall of the ANC is the fact of the collective decisions being taken. Mr. Mandela perhaps was the last leader allowed to be his own man and to take his own decisions. But all decisions are collective decisions. We have to accommodate the Women's League, the veterans, the trade unions, etc., etc. And in the end, Mr. Mr. Ramaphosa may be elected in December. If he doesn't play the tune, he may be recalled like Mr. Mabeki was recalled. And even if we get, and we will go, we will do that, get many, many people, also black people, obviously, and I just need to make that point. Anyone who thinks that the independence movement in the Cape is a racial thing is ignorant. It's not. You will have to look at the leaders, the membership of Cape Exit. You will have to look at the people participating in the marches. It's a multiracial, multilanguage, multicultural movement in the Western Cape. It's not a question of based on race at all. We understand that. But when you come to the election in 2024 on the national level, if the ANC goes below 50%, and that's going to happen, with whom are the ANC going to form a coalition? We don't know. Is it going to be the radical faction that forms that coalition with the EFF? That's the moment when Mr. Malema will step up and say, I can put the ANC back into government for a further term. Deputy President Malema, Minister of Finance, Floyd Shivambu. <laughs> and there we go. Let me conclude. Thank you for the participation tonight. Thank you for everybody. I enjoyed it as well. And I think the fact I've said in the beginning, two years ago, this debate would not have taken place. Because of what's happening, this is the reality that needs to be addressed and needs to be discussed. And if you can do it in future in the same vein, let's do that again and let's continue. I'd like to thank our panelists for making the time to join us here. This has been such an interesting conversation. I'd like to thank our in-person audience here. Thank you so much for this good-spirited and the passionate uh, response that you delivered. Thank you so much for watching this video. Show your appreciation by liking this video, subscribing to our channel, and sharing as widely as possible. My name is Donald, and you've been watching Worldview.